Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 13, Episode 137. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Wednesday, Steelers Nation. Dave, we are in the middle of the second week of Pittsburgh Steelers OTAs, getting to hear from new Steeler Marcus Golden on Tuesday. Team back out on the practice field for Wednesday and Thursday. New still fairly slow overall, but how you doing, Dave? All right, all right, all right, all right. My Matthew McConaughey opening mm-hmm. uh, uh, there. Uh, look, uh, getting into uh, getting into the month of June here, and obviously the second week of OTAs and some, you know, interview some more interviews this week. I think the roster, you know, the active roster still sits at eighty nine at this point, uh, 90 in total, when you consider Rennell Wren being on the, uh, IR, uh, the NFL PA was busy yesterday, finally getting all that backlog of transactions that we've been waiting to hit. So we can talk about some contracts today and talk about the salary cap situation with this team and go over some things that were, we're uh, set on on Tuesday there, and we can probably tease, hopefully, tease an interview today, right? For 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 Friday's show. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll just say hopefully there's going to be a really notable and fun interview that we'll have for Friday's show. So we'll kind of leave it at that. But I think it's going to be one that you guys are going to be excited to check out. But yeah, Dave, right now for Pittsburgh, Marcus Golden speaking to the media, as we just mentioned on Tuesday, thought it was a you know really good interview overall, saying all the right things. And if you look at that combined with the contract he signed for, which you can go into details of, he really wanted to come to Pittsburgh, it seems like. <laughs> yes, he did. Uh, the, 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 further, the more info, I got a little bit more last night from, uh, from Joe Corey uh, on the contract. And first and foremost, let's start with the fact that it's a veteran benefit contract, Alex, uh, uh, plain and simple, a one-year deal. Uh, got the minimal signing bonus allowed for such a deal, which is 152500 His base salary is the minimum for his credited seasons, which is $1.165. Uh, million, and that means the total that he's set to earn in 2023 is 1.3175 million. And it really, it, the only way it gets cheaper than that is if you don't give him the 152,500, uh, thousand, uh, 152,500 signing bonus there. And that's the only portion of the contract that's guaranteed is a signing bonus and to, uh, and that obviously comes with a reduced salary cap charge being as it's a veteran benefit contract, his salary cap charges, uh, almost 1.1 million, uh, specifically it's 1.0925 million. And it's got a split salary, uh, uh, clause in it as well too. Meaning that if he goes on, uh, I R, uh, reserve injured list for any length of time. His salary while he's on there is just six hundred thousand uh, uh, as a salary split on that. So once again, I mean, I, it, there's there's zero uh, things that you can find wrong with them. At least what I've seen so far when it comes to his tape and his contract and his demeanor, uh, all of that involved. Uh, you know, this is the same Marcus Golden that last year with the uh, Arizona Cardinals earned. I think his uh, cash payout for the year is three point six seven million uh, overall. There, so you really got a good deal with this. Obviously, he is up in age. Didn't have the the the, the best statistical uh, season, obviously, in two thousand and twenty two. But I did like his answer. Uh, 
yesterday when talking about, you know, you know, not having the sacks that he had the year four. And he basically said, look, you know, sometimes you, you, you know, I didn't do anything different. Sometimes the sacks come, sometimes the sacks don't. Uh, so once again, you know, I, I, I think looking at this from where we are right now at this point of, of, the off season and obviously him, him only being a steer for, for roughly a week, week or a little longer here. Uh, everything looks good. Yeah, it does. And yeah, to see that split salary too, usually that's reserved for guys that are just trying to fight to make their roster. So to see that, you know, included in that contract, is it almost a concern of how cheap this deal is? Do you kind of wonder what are, what are we not, what are we missing on Marcus golden? Cause everything else seems on paper to be a really good fit. Yeah. You know, I, and and I put this out on Twitter after he was signed. It's going to be kind of a hard hard contract or hard value to kind of gauge, you know, anywhere from probably what he made last year to a veteran benefit deal, uh, just because a he played what seven hundred and eighty one defensive snaps last year. Yeah, the uh, uh, statistically it wasn't the best season in the world, but I think you would agree when you go back and look at the tape from last year. I mean, it, it, he looked, uh, like he played, you know, uh, better than, than a minimum salary player overall. He's been around the league. He's obviously, you know, uh, uh, got some pass pass rush moves in him, like the hustle in him, like the play against the run there. Uh, I don't remember there being any, any huge health concerns, uh, when it comes to him other than, than, than a, uh, uh, contusion of the birth certificate, if you will. <laughs> but, uh, it, it is, it is, I'm, I'm mildly shocked that it came in a, 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 as cheap as it did. Now, one, you know, once again, he got cut by the Cardinals back right before the start of the new league year in March, obviously remained unsigned, uh, for all this time. And then, you know, these guys, once they get past the draft, they're exploring their options. They get into the first week of OTAs and are looking around and, and nobody wants them. So there is a, 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 at least a little bit of concern that makes you say, you know, why couldn't he have signed this same contract with another team before now? Or, you know, is this really what his market value is at this, at this point? Does this mean that you're not going to get any production uh, out of them? Uh, uh, or anything more than last year. I mean, even if you just got last year's production out of them, especially against a run, right? I, don't, I, 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 I don't see anything wrong with that. You, you would think with, with the guys that he's you know going to be filling in for and, and playing opposite sides of some of those sacks are just going to happen because <laughs> guys get run into them, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, that way there. So, uh, we'll see, but once again, I mean, I, you know, th- this is a huge bargain for a guy with that experience, but, uh, that's a long answer to just saying, I, I, I am a bit surprised it did come in this low. And I guess we got our answer whenever I post the question last week of why did Dupree get a two year offer and golden, a one year deal. That's because golden got the minimum essentially, and they weren't offering Dupree the minimum. And so I guess that's the answer of why those contracts were, were different, but yeah, I mean, overall, you know, you kind of have that thought if you get what you pay for in the back of your head, but saying all the right things, I think he's still got something left in the tank. I think he's, you know, certainly an upgrade over Malik Reed last year, the run defense, you know, some of that stuff is not as easily quantifiable as, as the, uh, the sack production. And, you know, the concern that I had also posed, not that I was, losing sleep over it, but just the the thought being down this road. So recently, you know, is he going to be comfortable coming off the bench, being a rotational guy, not being a starter, not playing six, 700 snaps a season. Like he's accustomed to golden saying all the right things, at least saying he doesn't care if he plays one snap or 30 snap, he's going to play hard. He knows his role, knows the situation. And so hopefully it's not going to be a Melvin Ingram 2.0 situation in 2023. How many snaps, uh, ideally, you know, let, let's say he got uh, 20 snaps a game feels high for him with, uh, with, with, with high Smith and Watt if they were to remain healthy for all 17 games, right? 
I mean, I, I usually in my head is about 20 to 25. If you know, Watt and Highsmith are coming off the field for about 10 snaps per game. What was Ingram playing? He was a little tricky because Highsmith missed time early in that year. Right. But towards the end, he was playing, played 17 snaps in the last game before he got traded. I mean, it, it depends a bit on obviously game circumstance, but I, I, I peg it at about 20 snaps per game. All right. What's 20 times 17? That's what, uh, uh, 340? Yeah, I was doing the math yesterday. It's it's in that range, 20 times 17. Yeah, 340. I mean, you would think this is a guy uh, that that would benefit from playing less snaps than he has overall. You know, in other words, be a little bit fresher and all like that, uh, unless he's unless he's the kind of guy that needs to ramp up, you know, which really there's no big history of that because of the the amount of snaps that he's played throughout his career there. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I would think, you know, uh, a snap total of anything under 500 would, would benefit him. And I kind of envision, I don't know, anywhere between three and six sacks potentially, uh, in the cards for him, obviously depending on, you know, uh, uh, game situations and all, I think he has that kind of production in him still. Sure. I think, you know, playing fresh and coming off the bench is best for him. I'm just saying it's the adjustment. The guys, I mean, last year he played 781 snaps, 2021, 682, even though he was kind of a rotational guy in 2020, 591, 2019, 916. So again, just for him mentally saying all the right things, hopefully he understands his role. He should, knowing that Highsmith coming off this big breakout season, probably going to catch a big contract, TJ Watt being TJ Watt you know you're not going to be getting playing time over those guys. So he should be able to understand his role. He still will just have to adjust to having a reduced role for really the first time in his career. Right, right. So, uh, you know, uh, w- once again, you know, knowing all that we know up until this point, and, and obviously he hit OTAs uh, yesterday that seemed to be limited in the video that was out there and all and uh, seems healthy. Uh, for lack of a better word, uh, you know, uh, you know I, 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 I can't find anything wrong with this. And he got the crucial J.J. Watt endorsement late oh. last night. Watt tweeting, um, and I can pull up the exact quote here, but it was, you know, very flattering things. And T.J. Watt last week made a reference to hearing nothing but good things from J.J. about Marcus Gold, who spent two years in Arizona together. Watt saying, quote, Junk is one of the best teammates I've ever been around. Love that guy. Going to give you everything he has every single time he steps on the field. Passion, energy, positive vibes. Just loves the game and loves life. Brother for life, Marcus Golden, end quote. And if you're wondering what junk means, I was as well. And you you found the article that references it. Uh, in 2015, Golden's rookie year in Arizona, he earned the nickname Junkyard or Junk for being a junkyard dog. And that actually came from Larry Foote, who was the linebackers coach in Arizona at the time for that just kind of all gas, no breaks mentality Golden plays with, which we still see on tape today. And so uh, J.J. Watt fully endorsing the move there. Yeah, and once again, you know, everything that 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 you know, we were privileged to get via video uh, on, on Tuesday certainly seemed to say all the right things. And, and he mentioned his uh, link to, uh, uh, which we have brought up before, to, to Denzel Martin, the outside linebackers coach. And... Uh, Look, if you go back to last year and and what this team had behind Highsmith and Watt in 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 primarily Malik Reed and we we kind of saw out of the shoot uh, the tape told us kind of what we were to expect there and we got that and a little less <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, if, if you will uh, you know I, I I don't think you disagree this is a this is a better option for number three than they had going into last year. Yes, definitely. And, you know, we did not use hindsight with Malik Reed. I mean, at the time when he got traded, we said, eh, I'm not really sure if this one's going to work. And and obviously it did not. So you feel more comfortable about the room with Golden's addition. The the room top to bottom is in better shape. Right. And you got a guy uh, that can, uh, another veteran guy in that, in that room that, you know, if, Nick Herbig, you know, is going to become or, or stay a guy on the outside. 
I mean, you got three guys that uh, now that have played a lot of snaps that can give him a lot of information. So he's uh, if Nick Herbig is to stay on the outside, it won't be for from uh, or if he's going to flourish on the outside, it won't be uh, from from lack of you know, tutelage, if you will, because he's got, uh, uh, three guys that have once again, that have played a lot of snaps and you even got a guy in golden that was that when he came out was, you know, he, he, a little bit thicker guy, obviously, but a guy that was in the measurable department, a little bit questionable. Yeah. The T-Rex arms, he's, he lacks the length that, um, like Herbig and I think our Josh Carney has an article today kind of talking about that, you know, Golden's kind of the perfect guy for Herbig to model his game after in terms of, you know, high energy, high motor, good athletes, but they, they lack maybe that prototypical length to play the position, but Golden's still carving out one heck of an NFL career. So all of that is good news there. Speaking of the Golden contract, Dave, can you just give us a quick update on the Steeler, on the Steeler salary cap situation as a whole right now, kind of where things project and where things sit? Yeah, uh, and once again, the NFLPA, I think, has everything accounted for now. And the key thing last night that allowed me to sleep is I match. Uh, as of Tuesday night, the Steelers are 16.144531 under the under the cap. Uh, if you account for it, and I, 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 here's something I need to ask Joel Corey. I wonder why the annual NFLPA workout bonus placeholder amount has not put in been put into place yet. Uh, uh, that that's uh, you know eight hundred forty nine thousand six hundred dollars. I wonder why that has not been inst- instituted at least on 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 the paperwork side. But uh, if you account for that, they are fifteen point two nine four. 931 under the cap. Uh, it is important to note that this team still has three unsigned uh, draft picks in uh, Broderick Jones, Joey Porter Jr., and Keanu Benton. If you want to factor in uh, what we are, what should be right on the money, if not off by a couple of cents, either way, uh, the slotting estimations for those three contracts. According to the current rule of 51, that'll use another 3.285 million in salary cap space. So if you want to look at this realistically as of Wednesday morning, uh, I have the Steelers at uh, projected to be a little more than $12 million under the cap uh, uh, right now, if you want to account for their remaining unsigned draft picks and, and the outstanding NFL PA workout bonus placeholder amount. So 12 million under, you know, they obviously have forthcoming charges that we like to keep reminding people about things like the end of rule end of the rule 51 with the 52nd and 53rd player, a full practice squad, Yo, uh, how many how many guys are they going to have on IR eating up some space that that need to be replaced at the start of the season? I budgeted three million dollars for that. Uh, you know, once again, I'm expecting this team to, to carry right around a nine million dollar in 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 season reserve amount there. So, you know, if you want to look at all the projected cost that this team has between now and week one of the regular season that would put them almost $5.5 million in the hole when it comes to being, uh, uh, cap related. However, you got that TJ Watt restructure at some point it's going to happen. I think between now and week one, and if they did a full restructure on that, they'd be 7 million to the good. We also have to remember that, you know, Alex Highsmith probably going to get a contract ex- extension at some point during the off season. That's likely to use up probably between three and three and a half million of that. However, there's also to keep in mind that the way the rule of 51 sits right now is probably not the way the top 51 is going to look come week one, meaning that you know, you could have some guys such as Kevin Dotson, Gunnar Olszewski, Montrevious Adams, Miles Killebrew, just to name a few that might not be on this roster. And if those those guys are replaced by 
uh, minimum salary rookie or first year type player deals, there's going to be some cap money to be uh, saved there. So uh, long story short, this team's in fantastic salary cap uh, 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 shape at this point right now, the off season. I envision there's actually probably two or three million that they could use to maybe go go elsewhere uh, if they wanted to sign another player or two, and especially if they're going to plan on doing a full contract restructure on Watt. But as I mentioned a couple of shows ago there, I think we are now in the territory, depending on which way this team wants to go, a, mm-hmm. a, 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 a potential to this team not having to do a full restructure on Watt and maybe just a partial restructure there. But uh, the, the, the big takeaway here is that there's plenty of room to do Alex Highsmith contract extension and get that done. Uh, there is enough room to maybe add another player or two of, you know, a couple of million or so uh, uh, cap hit, you know, should should that opportunity present itself. I was going to ask you, and you kind of just referenced it, you think if you had to guess between a full water restructure and, and a partial where you don't take that base salary down to the minimum, which way do you think Pittsburgh goes? I still think they're going to take the whole thing, just given some of the other moves that they're going to have to make. But what are your thoughts? My gut tells me that it'll be full still, but we also don't know what their plans are, you know, and that, that, mm-hmm. that makes it, you know, is, is there another guy or two out there uh, of, of, of a lower kind of, and, and also when you, when you think about, I mean, if I were to ask you right now, will all of Kevin Dotson, Gunnar Olszewski, Montrevious Adams, and Miles Killebrew, will all four of those guys be on the week one 53-man roster? No, I would say no pretty comfortably, but I guess my thought process there is, can you bank on that? Because the Watt restructure might come before those decisions have to be made. You know what I'm saying? If you right. if you bank on those guys not being there, then somebody else gets hurt, and all of a sudden we're, we have to keep a Dotson or an Adams you didn't account for. You know, then you're kind of in a trickier situation. So it's hard to uh, assume that you know it, that being the case come September 10th. And look, in in my projected numbers, there's there's a little bit of slush in there as well too, right? Because I, I I'm predict I'm, I'm predicting that this team. Uh, you know, we'll need to have, you know, an extra 3 million to cover for whoever might be on IR, uh, come week one. Uh, and, and also you know, I feel for, and, and I've, I've, I've felt pretty firm about this for a while. You know, they, the, the history of the last couple of seasons is they want $9 million just in free space overall on top of everything else to go into a season with for in season replacement fund or, or, or elevations or, or anything along those lines. So my gut still tells me that they, they, they will do a full contract restructure on what, but once again, we don't know what the plans are. We don't know what the outlook is on injury. So at, I am at the point though, that I won't be surprised if they don't have to do a full restructure on him. They're still going to, I think, do some sort of restructure on him. It Mm -hmm. just, I think we're in the neighborhood now is this, is this only going to be a half restructure? Is it going to be a full restructure? Something along those lines. But I mean, the main takeaway here at this point of, of the off season coming up on June 1st is they, they have more than enough room for the now. And by the, by the now meaning, they can go out and sign another player or two. They can they can comfortably do uh, an Alex Highsmith extension, and, and and like I always like to say, you got you have to draw lines in the sand when it comes to tracking the team's salary cap situation, because things that are that you know the future cost are things that don't have to be worried about for a while now. So even if you take out some of those things and factor in some sort of what restructure and, and, and an Alex Highsmith, uh, uh, extension, it still feels like there's, there's two or $3 million to play with there. Sure. No point, point taken in Pittsburgh, certainly in a, in a pretty good place right now. Just want to get your quick thoughts as well. Not that we're feeling anxious about it, but in terms of when these draft picks, uh, the, these deals get done for the top three, for Jones, for Porter Jr. And for Benton, any idea on a timetable? I know Skaronsky just signed his mm-hmm. deal. That was a little higher slot, but still just kind of, you know, getting 
some of those guys around Broderick Jones. Hopefully that one can get done soon just to get that one signed, sealed, delivered. Yeah, uh, and I, I think they're starting to fill in some holes around where Keanu Benton is. If I had to guess, uh, it would be Benton probably coming sooner rather than later. Mm-hmm. And then probably because broader we're broader, there's not much to really negotiate when it comes to his slotting. If he was around 20 or so, uh, it'd be one thing, but where he was picked, I mean, it pretty much dictates that it's going to be a fully guaranteed deal. And, and is there offset language to haggle over a little the, bit? Pro- probably not as much as if there was, if he was like, you know, 18, 19, 20 along those lines. I mean, to me, it okay. feels like it's going to be pretty cut and dry. So I would venture to guess that it will go. And, and as we had to talk about Joey Porter Jr., <laughs> that's where I think most of the, the, the haggle is going to be. Yeah. So, I think he's last to sign. Yeah. I, I think it goes, uh, uh, Broderick. I mean, I think it goes, uh, Benton, Broderick Jones, and then Joey Porter uh, junior. Uh, I, I think that, that that's the way that goes. I still think all three of those will be signed, sealed and delivered by obviously the, the start of training camp. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess the question becomes is how long, uh, after mandatory mini camps do, do, do some of these run. Right. We'll be watching that closely again. Not a, not a cause for concern, but something to know since we're talking contracts and cap right now. Speaking of delivered, uh, linebacker Mark Robinson had a delivery to the end zone yesterday, reportedly in Tuesday's practice, pick six, uh, pick sixing Kenny Pickett. Now it's it's OTAs, they're in shells. I saw some people criticizing Kenny Pickett <laughs> for this. No one should be doing that right now. Just uh, you know, talk about the guy that made the play on the positive end of things, and that's Mark Robinson getting extra first team reps with Cole Holcomb, who looks healthy and good, but is only in individual positional work right now. It's not been. Uh, has not graduated to the team work. Hopefully he will maybe mandatory mini camp, but certainly by training camp, he should be good. But Mark Robinson taking advantage of those reps. And, you know, I've talked him up quite a bit. That's probably the number one guy. I mean, obviously Kenny Pickett, George Pickens, but in terms of guys that you really want to see more of that didn't get to play a ton their rookie year, I really want to see Mark Robinson in your number two, again, being that former running back, converting to linebacker one year in college really being more comfortable. Now he's in his second NFL year, third year playing linebacker. He spoke about how he feels a lot more comfortable and confident in what he's doing right now. So I could really see a big jump in his play. And it sounds like he's making some plays already this spring. Yeah, this is the old uh, split the fan base in half off of uh, uh, one report. And we haven't even seen the play. Uh, uh, yeah, I told you Mark Robinson's going to be something. Yeah, I told you Kenny Pickett's going to be a <laughs> bust. or you, you know, th- th- those kind of things. Look, I, th- these kind of things are going to happen, you know, throughout OTAs, throughout mandatory mini camp, throughout training camp. There's going to be highs and lows on both sides of the ball. Uh, uh, you know, that, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's not freak out time or anything like that. Uh, it's one report. You know, I, I, I think the main, my main takeaway out of the quote unquote report is, Hey, it's good to see Mark Robinson making a play and, and uh, just leave it at that. You know, uh, uh, I don't, you know, I, I didn't think, Oh Christ, Kenny, you know, uh, mm-hmm. or, or, or anything along those lines. Uh, this is a young player, Mark Robinson, that, that you know, barely got to cut his teeth, uh, last season. And, uh, a guy that, uh, according to, to the interview, uh, text that's out there, uh, you know, that, uh, seems to be more comfortable as he should be going into his, his, his second trip around the sun, if you will. And, you know, I, I, once again, I think the main takeaway is, Hey, good. Mark Robinson made a play. Good for him. Do you think, who do you think starts? Cause I've kind of been on the, uh, had the opinion that, Robinson really could still work over Landon Roberts to open up the year. I know that probably most fans think that Roberts will be the guy, just given that he was signed and it's a two year deal. And, you know, he started all of last year um, for the, uh, what was he, Miami last year. But do you think there's a chance for Robinson to, to get the, the nod over top of Roberts? I'm going to, I'm going to give you an answer that, that, uh, that justifies why, why we earned the big bucks, right? Oh, uh, here we go. I don't know. Uh, 
And look, as I as I've learned to do over the years when doing this, uh, I like to trust my eyes with what I see. And I am not fortunate enough to do that until uh, the preseason gets underway. Uh, you obviously get to do it during training camp. And I take a lot away from what you uh, see and report and all like that. But uh, to me, it, it's just it, 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 it's it's too hard to really go on either side of the fence right now. I mean, this is a kid. How, how many snaps did, did Robinson play last year? Something like, I think, 44 defensive snaps, I want to say. You know, and there was some good and some bad in there. And I mean, it's just not enough to draw a hard, hard, hard conclusion on it. Obviously, they went out and got, ho- I'll tell you this, uh, uh, a takeaway that I have, uh, you know, we, we were told ahead of time, you know, after uh, Cole Holcomb was signed that he might, you know, be, be pretty much limited throughout most of the summer. And at least from some of the videos that have circulated, he's out there moving around real well for this time of year. So I think there's a positive to take away from that. Uh, We obviously know what a Landon Roberts or what we think a Landon Roberts uh, brings to the table in there uh, as as far as a a second, you know, linebacker that can, you know, be in there on early downs, specifically run downs and stuff like that. I I just, I think it's too early to sit here and, and be on one side of the fence versus the other and say, yeah, I think week one, we're going to see Holcomb. If, if two linebackers are out on the inside linebackers are out on the field, it's going to be Holcomb and Mark Robinson, or it's going to be Holcomb and Atlanta. I just think it's too early to call that kind of stuff. Sure. I'm not, I'm not trying to call anything. I just want to open up that possibility because I really think Robinson's going to have a strong camp and, you know, continue and pick up where he left, left off last year. And he's got, and I know Roberts is a, is a similar dude in terms of downhill facing the fan, not afraid to hit you, but Robinson, I think maybe that, you know, his game's going to hopefully accelerate, you know, exponentially, not just on this kind of slow uptick, but hopefully a really big jump in that, in that second year. And I think he could really make some plays. It's going to make it, at the least, I think Pittsburgh is going to have to find a way to get this guy on the field defensively because there's going to be some really good value of what he can do against a run, against AFC North teams in a tough physical division. You want guys like Mark, Mark Robinson out there playing for you. What are what are what were your hardest takeaways from the 40 something snaps that Mark Robinson played last season? I didn't think the moment was too big for him. I mean, obviously it wasn't perfect, but he was the same dude that I saw in, in the summer in training camp in the preseason. He's downhill. He's quick trigger. He's physical. He wraps up. He hits you for sure. Um, I don't think he's a total liability in coverage. I think there's you know, certainly work to be done. He's never going to be a, a dime linebacker, third down you know, type situation guy, but I, he's, he's a lot of Vince Williams in his game. And I thought when he got out, got out there on the field, he held his own. I guess if your main question is, do do I think it could happen that we could see Holcomb and, and, and Mark Robinson be the be the opening tandem? Yes, I think it could. OK, fair enough. And so obviously Robinson will have to continue and, you know, Roberts will, won't, will not be a pushover and he's got the more extended resume. And again, he's cut from a similar cloth as, as Robinson. So it's not that Robinson's skill set will be incredibly unique. I just think he could really have a strong summer that's going to compel this team to find ways to play him. All right. And a long summer it is. Yes, it is. All right. What else do we have here, Dave? Just kind of a quick note on DeAndre Hopkins. We'll see where he ends up now officially been released by the Arizona Cardinals. Sounds like there's some AFC North teams that are in those waters, fishing in those waters, as Mike Tomlin likes to say, not Pittsburgh, but Cleveland and Baltimore have been linked to Hopkins. So have the chiefs and bills. Maybe there's some dark horse to team that emerges as well, but uh, could be facing D hop twice a year, Dave. Yeah, it'd be interesting. He went out and got an agent now and uh, going to be, a, you know, I, I think there's been, I think everybody's just speculating at this point, though. I don't know if there's really a true leader in the clubhouse, right? I mean, Deshaun Watson uh, saying what he said uh, on Tuesday is not surprising because obviously those two played together. Uh, I, I do think that there is a potential uh, fit for him uh, with Cleveland. Uh uh, people's, uh, they've got, uh, Mari Cooper over there. Right. And, 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 uh, Donovan people's Jones sort of kind of came in, has been coming into his own. I think they went out and got, didn't they get Mark, uh, Marquise, uh, 
uh, uh, Goodwin. Goodwin. Yeah, they got him, Elijah Moore. They draft Cedric Tillman, so they've certainly made changes to that wide receiver room. Right. So uh, for for the right price, could they find a way to to put him uh, uh, in, on that depth chart? I I think so. Uh, and and you know, but. You know, I think Buff- Buffalo and the Chiefs are other speculated spots. You know, I think there was a report that, that Baltimore did their homework on him. He might not end up in any in any one of those four. So I think it's just one of those, you know, uh, let's table the, the, the discussion on him until we do find out uh, where he does land. Look, if he does land in the AFC North, though, uh, with one of those two teams, you know, it it it. it it's just another experienced guy that the Steelers have to worry about, you know, for two games a season. Yeah. Another top receiver. I know that Hopkins, you know, is kind of closer to the back end of his career, but still had a really strong 2022 after he missed that, the, the opening with uh, that suspension that he had. So still a big threat. My, my gut says Buffalo. I know there's kind of been mixed reports to maybe Buffalo's not quite as in it as I originally thought, but my gut still says he ends up a bill. All right. Uh, that's kind of, with those names out there. That's kind of the 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 first thought in my head where he might land. But be interesting to see. Yeah, you know, look, the money's going to speak volumes here. I think, right? Mm-hmm. And but he also didn't he say like the like to have like to go to a team where he thinks he could win a Super Bowl and and has has a a uh, strong quarterback system and all. So that you know. Everybody thinks you're going to win the Super Bowl, all 32 teams at this time of the year. But how many realistically have the chance to do that? You know, and how, sure. how many of them have have the, the 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 good enough quarterback situation? Yeah, very very few, and that's why Buffalo, I think, makes a lot of sense. But we'll we'll see what happens. It might might not get our answer today or tomorrow, but maybe in a couple of days. So, anything else here, Dave? Again, new cycle, pretty quiet right now Jalen Warren it, it, it really is off season season when we're talking about some pony backfield stuff Jalen Warren said <laughs> maybe him and Najee Harris can get on the field they actually got on the field a couple snaps together late last season but Warren said the team's kind of toying with that idea here in May yeah is it already that time of season where we're talking mm-hmm. about about that uh I'll, you know uh, I'll say what I've learned to say over the years I'll believe it when I see more of it you know uh, look, I'm all up for them doing a lot of different things on offense, personnel groupings and, and things that, that we haven't seen a lot of, uh, in, in, in recent years. So, uh, I welcome that, that, that kind of stuff. Now, look, you are you going to see 25% of the snaps be that no. Uh, but, uh, uh, I, I think Jalen Warren, he's a fun kid to listen to, isn't he? I mean, I, mm-hmm. he, he is a kid that just gets it. I think that, uh, you know, basically, you know, uh, got to continue to prove himself and, and, you know, like what we saw out of him, uh, during his rookie season showed that he can catch the ball out of the backfield showed that he can run with the football. Uh, I, I remember pulling up that play, uh, just, uh, in this past week of him, uh, Kitty have to get flushed and kind of you know, trying to make a play and getting it to him behind the line of scrimmage on a third down and, and Warren fighting for that extra, extra yardage there. And then, you know, look at, uh, how, how, you know, how he came into his own as a pass protector and, and the, the game's not too big for him. So, uh, if that means getting him on the field more either to spell Najee or to get him on the field more in, 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 in some two running back, uh, type personnel groupings, I, I'm all for it. I don't, I don't think it's too big for him. No, it's not. And for a guy that's real salt of the earth, I mean, he had a heck of a journey to the NFL, light recruit, snow college, Utah State, Oklahoma State, undrafted, make the team, carve out a role. I mean, it has been everything or nothing given for Jalen Warren, and that's why yet you, you love this guy. You want, you love watching him play, and why he's got that team first mentality. I mean, I had the video and I still have that thought that he's as much fun to watch without the football as he is whenever he's actually, you know, carrying or catching the football. I mean, he's just an all effort type of dude. So um, yeah, there may be some ways to get him out there and some pony stuff for a couple snaps. Obviously will not be a staple or anything even close to that, but you know, you have some, uh, I think a lot of versatility and flexibility with your formations, your personnel groupings this year. And that's going to be, you know, something that should make this offense better. Out of everything that's come out of OTA so far, which obviously isn't much, uh, 
what what has you the most concerned? I mean, it's hard to be concerned about any one thing because they were not there. And, you know, generally there's a more optimistic touch to OTAs across the NFL. I mean, obviously I still have the concerns about the slot corner situation. I mean, there is a bit, a bit of lack of depth at inside backer, number three running back. I think for me, it's still slot corner is that chief concern right now, but there's nothing happening at OTAs that's furthering that concern. I'm just looking at who they have and wondering how it's going to work. Okay, fair enough. Uh, tell people about that series that you started. Yeah, uh, we had one. I kind of two, well, a mini one going right now, uh, ranking the Steelers off season main editions. This is a two part series, but I'm also doing a, a longer series on the top 10 single season performances in Pittsburgh Steelers history. So the best individual player seasons in any one season in franchise history, number 10 was Louis Lips in 1985 for a 1,000-yard season and averaging almost 20 yards per catch with a rushing touchdown and two punt return touchdowns, became the first receiver in NFL history to have a 1,000 yards receiving and two punt return touchdowns in the same year, still only one of four players to ever do that. At number nine was a guy we just talked about, Le'Veon Bell, in 2014 with over 20, uh, 2,200 yards from scrimmage. That's a Steelers record, 23rd all-time. And so we'll be working down the list from uh, 10 to 1. And uh, it's a really hard list to put together. I was finding out there's a lot of good candidates on there. I wish we could make this a list of 20, but keeping it at 10. But um, there's going to be some interesting names, maybe a couple names you don't expect to be on that list that will be on there uh, later this offseason. How would you grade the Steelers' entire offseason uh, to this point? Everything, the draft, free agency, uh uh, cap management, uh, contracts, uh, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle releases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I did my Omar Khan report card a couple weeks ago for the off season. And I think I gave it an A. I was a little less focused on the letter grade and just kind of talking about the things that I liked and the things that I, I didn't like as much, but yeah, I think Omar Khan's done a good job. Again, this roster looks almost completely different from that bottom half. You're going to have a lot of new players and some of those will not work out. That's just the math of it all. There's going to be some guys we're excited about now. We, we sit here a year from now and say, yeah, that one was a miss, or this guy got hurt, or this thing just didn't work out quite the way that you hoped that it would. But um, I think Omar Khan certainly made this roster in his vision. I think it was a clear plan. I think the draft was excellent. I, I like the aggressiveness. I like you know looking at every avenue to acquire talent, whether that's signings, trades, claims, XFL-type guys, really just, you know, getting guys from every path, every avenue possible to add to this roster. So overall, I'm happy. Would the biggest surprise to date this offseason be the early release of Arthur Millette? Would that be the single one biggest uh, surprise or may or Mason Rudolph re-signing a, 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 a minimum salary contract. I mean, and if we're that low on the list of being surprised by a number three quarterback coming back on a minimum salary, you know? Sure. Just didn't expect it to happen. I mean, I still think the Allen Robinson deal came out of left field, but I don't, I mean, it was a, it was a good move. They gave up nothing for this guy. I think he's going to have a role, going to be able to contribute. So yeah, I would say the the top three unexpected moves this year were the Robinson trade, Rudolph returning and Millette being released, although it sounds like that was more Millette pushing his way out and not Pittsburgh on their own voluntarily cutting him. And then I would say probably signing Marcus Golden to a, a veteran benefit deal would 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 rank in the top five things, right? Yeah, I mean, but again, on paper, it looks like a really good deal for Pittsburgh to get that veteran number three for that cheap is uh, you, you can't do better than that. Has there been any drama at all or any, any, I mean, it doesn't feel like it feels like it's been, e not that they've had a lot of that last couple off seasons. Right. But, uh, uh, does it feel like, man, this, you know, you know we're, we're not talking, we're talking more about transactions and things that are happening, you know, kind of on the field or, or draft related as opposed to news items outside of all that. Yeah. I mean, the biggest off-field stories. I mean, Millette seemed unhappy, you know, in, in kind of some of the stuff he posted right after getting cut. TJ Watt fell in his pool and Kenny Pickett got his car stolen. But other than that, I mean, I guess, you know, everything's been, been okay. I would agree. Uh, it's been a good off season for this team.
for sure. I'm not going to hopefully it, you got that long stretch between once they break and after mandatory mini camp to training camp and you got six weeks where you hope everybody is. Mm. I mean, they had the, you know, Jameer Jones thing, which isn't drama, but there was an off the field, you know, arrest that, that led to his release, but obviously nothing that's, it's going to really make headline news. I, I would agree. All right. All right. I think it's time to get through some reader emos and close out today's show. All right, let me pull up the email machine here. What did you think about? Did you read over the, uh, the, uh, you know, we asked Clayton uh, to put together the, uh, what was it? The, the yak study? Uh, yeah, the yak study uh, related to, to playoffs. Uh, I'm trying to, I just had skimmed it whenever it came out. I'm trying to think what uh, Clayton's overall conclusions were, but you can read that. It's correlation of, of NFL offenses, yak, and playoff success. And I'm trying to see what his um, overall conclusion was. He says, no offense in the time made the playoffs with a yak completion result of 3.5 or less, which is the floor for what the Steelers should aim for to return to the playoffs. The standard is higher than that, though, in Pittsburgh. Um, so, yeah, basically saying there is a, you know, if you're going to, you know, make the playoffs and be a, a potent offense. You better have some yak ability, and Pittsburgh's going to have to be a lot better than that next year, and, this this season. And, and, and not surprising, right? We've talked a lot about yak. Uh, last it feels like last couple of uh, uh, definitely this for for this past off season here. Uh, but with this offense, what was specifically or or what we envisioned as being, uh, show sure feels like they better be around four point oh you know, 3.8 to 4.0 when it comes to yak. Yeah. I mean, I would just chalk that up to, you know, the best offenses in football are generally some of the best teams in football and the best offenses in football probably are good yak teams because they're probably good in a lot of offensive categories, especially as it relates to the passing game in this modern NFL. And so I, I don't know, I wouldn't say it's, it's like, you know, correlation without causation, but they're all kind of intertwined where, where good offenses are, you know, big play explosive. They're going to naturally create yak because they're big explosive offenses. All right. Uh, so kudos to Clayton for jumping right out on that. He does tremendous work. You know, he, he jumps right on that stuff. Yeah. And I, I will say, just say looking at his chart, just seeing the Steelers yak decline literally year over year since 2018. It's a, it's a disturbing trend. Yeah. Look, uh, you go away. And I mentioned this the other day, you go back several years ago when, 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 uh, who was it? Eli Rogers, I think, or, or yeah, I think it was Eli, right? You know, they, the, the big talk that off season was how they got to get more yak and they, and, and they, they really do. So that's something that we're really going to be focused on once this season starts and, and, and tracking the yards after, after mm-hmm. catch kind of thing. All right. Uh, let's see. Email machine. Sean Irvine writes in, Hey guys, have you considered layering, layering in some audio clips into the show, whether it be interview snippets, presser clips, uh, could be a nice way to add an additional dimension to the show, or is the juice just not worth the effort of the squeeze there? I mean, we've thought about it and all, you know, I, I've toyed with, uh, uh, doing stuff like that, but you know, I, I, I you know, the editing portion of that versus the return and look, most everybody, a, a, a lot of people that 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 listen to this show, I think at least stay in tune with either uh, the text or the, or the audio that comes out across the internet related to this stuff. And usually, if there's anything worth talking about, we usually try to quote unquote uh, uh, this, that, and the other. So, uh, my, my, my takeaway or my, my quick answer to your question, Sean would be uh, the juice is not worth, worth, worth the effort there because it creates more editing, uh, uh, things. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, we don't, you know, we don't get the audio clips ourselves, so we're not, you know, we don't own those per se. So it, it, it you know, you, you kind of potentially set yourself up for more problems that way. Yeah, that's certainly a concern. I, I've thought about trying to add something, some other uh, outside audio for my terrible takes, but just given the time and trying to find when's the right time to put some of that stuff in, I haven't. But yeah, I think Dave and I are always thinking about different things we can do and ways to improve and you know add add new things to the podcast and in the site. So it's a it's a worthwhile thought. 
And look, we, we, you know, we, we come up with some outside interviews from time to time. We hope to record one tonight. It'll be in Friday's show that we think you all will enjoy. So, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep efforting those kind of, uh, additions to the podcast here. Uh, Brandon writes in, he, uh, he, uh, wants to know about Cameron Dantzler, the cornerback who was cut, I think yesterday by the Vikings, right? Uh, yes. he says, uh, can't hurt but not at 2.7 million, if that's correct. Uh, yeah, look, uh, you're not a guy that you're going to claim off waivers, but, uh, I mean, we'll see. I went, uh, right after that news broke, seemed like they talked, he was a guy that they talked to at the combine a couple of years ago. He, he's the Southern Miss kid, wasn't he? Or Mississippi Dantzler, State? Mississippi he was Mississippi State, State yeah. I think. Yeah, he wasn't Southern Miss. Um, I can look up for sure Pittsburgh's interest in him. Uh, he went to yeah Mississippi State. Uh, I thought they pick. talked to him at the uh, combine that year. Probably. Uh, I can I can check here. Maybe try to hopefully quickly pull up. He's some had some. He's had a couple of injury concerns uh, though as well. I think when he's played, he's played okay. But I think uh, the injury knock. I mean, the fact that they're, you know, for, for just a 2.7 million salary that they, they, they've decided to part ways with him, uh, on that. I mean, look, I, I, I say it time and time again, I, I I'd sign Alex for a minimum salary benefit mm-hmm. contract. I don't know. We, they, they, they need the roster spots there. So no offense, Alex. And, uh, I can't be number 90. No. Yeah. You're, 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 uh, I, I think your arms are a little short as well, too. <laughs> hey, if Nick uh, Herbert can make it, I can make it. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I, I guess long story short, could it be a guy that they'd be interested in, in uh, when, it, when it comes to a minimum salary? I'm not going to say no. They did meet with him at the Combine uh, in 2020, but he didn't run well. I think he profiles more as a zone corner. He was in Minnesota, in Washington, and so those are kind of more zone-based teams. Do you need another outside corner? I mean, it doesn't hurt, but I don't know if you really need another at this point. You signed Barku from the XFL. Yeah, I'm not going to say that it's not going to happen, but I don't really see the uh, the big pressing need to go right. get him. Uh, and if they did, it would be a minimum salary there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Can I interrupt you real quick on yeah, the emails? I'm, I'm going to ask you one more thing about uh, some very small piece of news that came across. Did you have any issue with George Pickens' comments about he said he was a Pro Bowl snub in 2022? Felt like he should have made it over some of the guys who did. So ostensibly, that means making it over Stephon Diggs, Tyreek Hill, Jamar Chase, et cetera. Is that just you just chalk that up to standard receiver talk? Do you have any sort of issue with that? I don't have I don't have a problem with him saying that, but I mean, I, I think anybody, I, I, I think it's a reach to say that he was snubbed. Oh yeah. I mean, obviously I think it's, you know, totally not correct, but obviously, you know, Pickens is going to be the most confident guy in himself. Right. Um, I, I, some people will say, you know, is this a red flag about him getting too, too diva, like too full of himself? I, I, I wouldn't go that far. Um, I think Pickens is a pretty confident dude. I don't think it, it crosses that line. But you know, just says that he he wants to be better and, and kind of keep setting his goals higher and higher. Right. And once again, I don't, I don't have a problem with the words coming out of his mouth. But I mean, I okay. think I, I I think he's wrong. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, uh, hopefully, we're having those conversations where you know he's a pro bowler or or if he doesn't make it, that man, can you believe he got snubbed? Le- you know, legitimately got snubbed, kind, kind of thing. I think that 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 would obviously be a good pro. Hey, look, uh, quite question, uh, and I put this up on a poll oh, a week or two ago or whatnot. Will any of these three, or will any wide receiver, will any uh, player on the Steelers in 2023 have reached the 1,000 yard receiving mark? Yeah, I think so. Um, I wouldn't even rule out two. I would not rule out Deontay making it if they use him more yak friendly. I mean, he still had almost 900 despite no touchdowns and you know a terrible decline in in yak. And Pickens was over 800, I think. And I think he's going to be a downfield threat and probably you know add to and expand his route tree. So I, I wouldn't even rule out both guys getting right around uh, four digits. But I think certainly one of them will end up being there. So you'll guarantee one of them ha- well, having at least one 
1,000 yards? Because here's my thoughts on it. I, I think if they run this offense and have the success they want want, want to have, they're going to run the football uh, successfully, and they're going to spread the football around quite a bit. So, uh, and I don't, I don't necessarily – I think you can win and be a competitive team and be a playoff team uh, without a, 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 a – uh, 1000 yard, uh, receiver. So I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that that's a negative, but I'm not, I'm not 100% per, convinced that they'll have a 1000 yard receiver in 2023. Yeah. I don't want to guarantee anything because the structure of the offense is not as friendly to that as, as many others in the NFL. But I mean, Pickens was at 801 last year on 52 grabs. I mean, can he get 200 more yards in a year or two wherever he's going to be more involved in this offense and really hit the ground running? He can't get 200 more yards out of this thing? It's possible. Yeah, and Deontay, what, what was Deontay's final number last year? 850-something? It was 882. He can't get 120 more yards, and his yards per catch can't go back up to around 11, which is where it was sitting for most of his career prior to 2022. Yeah, but how, how how many yards did they get out of the slot last year, and and how much will will go that direction this year, or sure. to the backs? You know. Yeah, I get that, but I mean, we think Deontay's gonna have better yak. Like his yak should hopefully return to a more normal number, and that that might cancel out. You know, losing some, I mean, losing a couple of targets here and there. Uh, I you know I, I what I'm trying to convey here is I could see uh, zero to two. Uh, I, I just don't think it's a slam dunk, you know? Okay. Yeah. I don't think it's a slam dunk either, but I, I think I, I would bet on at least one and I don't rule out two happening. All right. Uh, this one from, uh, Chris Furland writes in taking everything we know on paper into consideration, how many wins and what sort of stat line do you need to see at a minimum to believe this team made the right choices and are at least trending in the right direction? Thank you both for your work. You guys are consistently one of the best sources and keep me from overreacting to everything this team does. That's kind of a loosely based question because he says stat line. Uh, what sort of stat line? Uh, look, I. I'll tell you stat lines. I'll go over them again. You know, your explosive plays, you need probably a, a 20, at least a 20% increase in, in, in explosive plays. Uh, the yards after the catch, man, we, we've got to see that be around uh, a lot closer to four for this team. And we're just talking about on, on the offensive side of football here. Uh you know, Kenny Pickett and the adjusted net yards for passing attempt stat that, that people get tiresome of me talking about that, that we need to see that man at a minimum, I, it feels like that's gotta be 6.5, you know, along those lines, which is low, but, uh, uh, I think you can, can win if you have the running game, uh, related to that. Uh, so, I mean, offensively, I think just, just a flat out, uh, uh, adjusted net yards for passing attempt. I think the explosive plays, you got to see an increase of those. And I think the yards after the catch, if we're just talking offense in, in, in general, as far as minimum of some stat lines there, as far as wins go, uh, for this to be considered trending in the right direction and, 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 and kind of, uh, you know, saying that, that they made the right choices, you know, this off season. It feels like 10 is a number in my head. Yeah, I mean, for the stat line, I agree. Just to also mention, be better than 23rd in red zone offense, which is what they've been each of the last two years. I think at least crack the top half in points per game. Those are some stats. Get back to, you know, threatening for 50 plus sacks as a defense. You know, get that streak going again, which was broken last year when TJ Watt missed the first half of the season. For me, it's at, at the least get back to the playoffs. Uh, ideally win a playoff game because this drought, I think, is getting frustrating. And I understand it's a tough AFC North. It's a tough AFC. None of this is going to be easy to do. But if you really want to, if you're going to be just this, you know, in the mix team forever against these great quarterbacks, you're going to kind of be stuck for a long time. You got to get out, get over that hump and not just be a 10 win team that's fighting for the last wild card spot. You, you want to be more than that. So ideally, in terms of, of the trend, at least make the playoffs. But you, I mean, obviously, you want to win a playoff game and kind of get that. Uh, that that streak snapped. I, I I would agree because we're 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 in that uncharted territory for this team and not winning a playoff game. 
Yeah, 2016. And again, I know each year's had different issues and all that, but come on. I mean, it, it, it's getting a little ridiculous. Uh, all right. I think I've gotten through the few emails that we've gotten since uh, the last show there. So you got any any other? Uh, we string this out five more minutes. Maybe we'll get some breaking <laughs> <laughs> breaking news. But you got anything else to add uh, on, on top of it here? Sign the 90th player, Omar. I, I'm, I'm waiting. I just I'm on pins and needles waiting for that that news to break. I thought maybe it would happen on Monday ahead of OTAs, but just give me give me that last player on the roster, uh, Mr. Khan. And correct me if I'm wrong. We didn't hear anything about the long snapper coming in yesterday, right? Was he not on the transactions list for the tryout? I guess I'm not even well, sure if they post that stuff right now. Yeah, the, uh, they post those on a different sheet that, that we have to rely on other people reporting. They don't put it on the right. main transaction sheet. So I, I don't remember it being uh, reported yesterday by anybody that he was in for a visit or anything or a tryout or anything like that. Yeah, that's Antonio Ortiz, the long snapper from, I think, TCU. So, yeah, I mean, it, I imagine it, it may have already happened or happening today. So we'll wait and see. All right. Uh, let's see. In the meantime, uh, and, and just a note, once again, we have uh, for now moved the podcast uh, hosting over to Spotify. Got a good conversation coming up with those uh, with some uh, uh, people with them, I think, uh, in the next several days here. Uh, we're, we're giving that a whirl. If you don't already go to actual Spotify and find the, the terrible podcast. And if you're a member on Spotify, follow the show that way helps the metrics that way. Uh, if you would and, and, and poke around, you know, once again, if you, if you, if you listen to the show on whatever platform that you, uh, listen to or whatever podcast machine, as I like to say, you should still be able to do so. So, you know, you don't, if, 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 if you're a guy that's or a person or, uh, that's stuck in your ways that way, you know, we don't want you to change that, but if you do feel so cl- inclined, uh, go to Spotify and follow the show over that, uh, over there, if you have an account, uh, over there. So, uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot, follow Alex at Alex underscore Kazora, follow the show at terrible podcast, email the show, the terrible podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, Steeders Depot.com hit the donate button, upper right navigational bar. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, Steeders Depot.com, Hit the ad free button up right navigational bar. Uh, hope to really flow out the content again today as uh, this team works through their second week of OTA practices. And until Friday, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.